Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Today, our guest is Kenneth D. Frank, author of Sex and City Plants, Animals, Fungi, and More, A Guide to Reproductive Diversity. It was just released about a couple of weeks ago by Columbia University Press. He's also written The Ecology of Center City, Philadelphia. He's a longtime resident of Philly uh, and a retired physician. His previous publications deal with the ecological effects of outdoor lighting, the mysterious disappearance of a giant silk moth, sounds like a science fiction movie, um, and that jumping spider's decision to forego being a night hunter to a day warrior. Um, <laughs> It's tough to live in a city, sometimes for humans and oftentimes to our non-human friends, both plants and animals. Concrete, asphalt, stone walls. Um, I remember a picture from the book that had the address 266 South 23rd, and I hope I'm not giving away the confidentiality of the creature that was there. Um, uh, it's tough to figure out how to live with these obstacles. Traffic, noise, lots of artificial life, uh, sewage, pollutants. And hey, those are good reasons for people to head for the suburbs too. Um, but notwithstanding, uh, uh, flowers, plants, moths, spiders, sparrows, hawks, uh, other cute and furry friends, they've figured out a way to do it. A and most importantly about the book, how do they bring their offspring into the world? Why? Sex, of course. You know, breeding systems, sex change, sex conflict, trauma, disease, even cannibalism and aphrodisiacs. Once again, again, not too far from our own behaviors and difficulties. So with that, welcome again, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Hey, so I guess we should start with the obvious concept. It's the first word in the title, sex. So let's define, I mean, it seems kind of like elemental, but let's define what sex is and what reproduction associated with it means to us, both because we wouldn't be having a conversation without it. Right. Well, I use uh, the term in two ways in, in my book, basically. Uh, one is a state of being that is male or female, and the other as a process, such as in mating. Uh, but the term, the term uh, is used by different specialists in different ways. For example, in bacteria, uh, the term is used simply in when one bacterium transfers genes to another, that's considered by microbiologists to be sex. So the term has some flexibility built into it. Well, just if we deal with ourselves and sex, not gender without being risking being canceled, but with regard to sex, uh, we just think of there's one way in which to procreate. It's a fairly simple tab A into slot B. Um, <laughs> but with regard to your book, especially since some aspects, I mean, it's very readable, very accessible, but some aspects are technical. And those technicalities generally deal with the different types of, man, well, different manners in which reproduction occurs. Sometimes it's asexual. Sometimes one creature is having sex with itself, in essence. Go over like just a few of those, because that's what people who come into my bookstore, and I'm trying to sell the book, but once they see the word sex, they're gonna, they want, <laughs> they'll hang out for a bit. But um, yeah, talk a little bit about the different types of sexual reproduction, which have nothing to do with what we do. Yeah, well, uh, great, great question. The, the uh, plants have a much wider variety than, than animals. And uh, for example, dandelions, I find them very interesting. Uh, dandelions in North America produce seed without fertilization. But in Europe, uh, some dandelions produce seed with fertilization and some without. 
so that sex and dandelions depends on what continent you're talking about. Um, in aphids, uh, the milkweed aphid, which I describe in the book, there are only females. Uh, and those females produce only females, and there are no males and no mating. But in other aphids, there's mating part of the year and, and producing uh, young without mating in other parts of the year. Uh, the, the variety is fantastic. In the case of the sidewalk crack plant chickweed, um, a chickweed flower starts out as male in the morning and it cannot fertilize itself because it's just one sex. Um, but a insect pollinator can pick up pollen from that male. And then later in the afternoon, the flower becomes both male and female and a pollinator can now pollinate the flower if it hasn't. Uh, and, and then if, if no pollinator comes, it pollinates itself. Um, so in the city where there are few pollinators, chickweed can have it both ways. It can cross pollinate if there are pollinators or it can self pollinate if there are no pollinators. It's funny. It's like, you know, you think of necessity as a mother of invention and, and you talk, you use the proper word term is like selecting for, and there's so many things in your book that it seems as if the environment required evolutionarily selecting for, Hey, let's just be one sex in the morning and one sex in the afternoon. It just, and it's, and for someone who doesn't study it, it's mind boggling. And you do say, you know, you go, you say it's not over hundreds, thousands, it's perhaps millions of years. But talk a little bit about how that process works and how, okay, these guys die out because, hey, we forgot we need to change. And then all of a sudden, a few of them say, you know, this would make more sense. Yeah, well, uh, that's a, you know, we, we think of, 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 of um, sexual reproduction as the best way to do it because it generates diversity. Our offspring are never the same as ourselves upon which natural selection can act creating evolution. So sex is like the driver of evolution or at least the fuel provides a fuel for natural selection and evolution. But we have some plants that don't do sex. Well, how did that happen? And I describe the, the uh, moss. There's a, a moss that grows on tree bark that expresses no sex. Um, this, this particular moss um, expresses sex only in Austros Australasia, but not in our country. And no one knows for sure why that happened. But when you think about it, it might be advantageous if there are no, if your populations are very, are, are, are very sparse, not to produce sexually because you won't find a mate. And this plant, because it can produce asexually, thrives in low densities where mates might not be present. But like in cloning or other asexual reproduction, then as you were saying, the diversity in the gene pool never occurs. But is that because the animal or plant saying, hey, we're fine, we don't really need to change like a crocodile or a cockroach or a, a trilobite when they were around? Is it, is it just like saying, hey, this is good, we don't really need diversity? Well, that, that's, that's really fascinating. It, there may be an advantage not to having diversity. If you have a perfect, perfectly adapted organism, then diversity in your offspring is harmful 
because they'll never be as well adapted as you. So for some organisms, uh, uh, cloning may be the most efficient way of maintaining uh, your adaptability to a, to a niche. It, it's interesting because when you read the book and this as a bookseller, these are the type of books I like and my customers feel the same way because even though it has nothing to do with your book, you then start thinking, wait a minute, what about us as human beings? Have we reached that point? Although in today's world, obviously it doesn't seem like we have. Um, have we reached the point where, okay, this is good, or are we going to evolve sillily to lose our hair, which you, you have and I have already to a certain extent, but, you know, I'm just asking it off the wall. What do you think? I mean, do you think we still have a ways to go in terms of, although we're now kind of, kind of controlling it ourselves? You mean, is are, natural, we gonna, are, 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 we, are, are we still evolving? Are we going to select out for our little toe? <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, the, the, the possibility of, of our genetically engineering ourselves so that we're, we're, we avoid diseases, inherited diseases is still, is still out there. Um, and, and maybe we, we will uh, in the future um, evolve through our own interventions in the laboratory. Which is really an interesting concept, but I didn't mean to throw you a curveball here. So what I wanted to get to, especially since before we started, we were talking about, we were both talking about cracks in the sidewalk and you even mentioned it. So we've, de we've, we've defined to a certain extent sex and reproduction. Let's define one, what a city is, and to what our city is with regard to the subject matter of the book. Yeah, well, how do you define city is a great, great question because when, when biologists um, do studies on the effect of cities on this or that, they have to define what they mean. And if they compare how an organism behaves in the city versus not in the city, they have to have some operational definition. And one operational definition is the percent of surface area covered by impermeable surfaces like concrete or asphalt. Um, so when uh, uh, looking at a urban gradient from high urbanization to low urbanization, uh, high urbanization would have a high percentage of the surface area in question covered with say concrete and asphalt and a low, low urbanization would be soil, lawns, uh, forest uh, without impermeable surfaces. It's it always struck me how in addition to reproduction, the basic instinct, if you will, of any organism is, hey, I have to keep going. We have to keep going. And I remember when I lived in Florida and people would grow bamboo and I would say, don't grow bamboo because no matter where you put it, it'll grow through concrete, it'll go through asphalt and you'll have it all over the place. And it's like it says, you know, I want to be everywhere. I have no desire to end myself. And that kind of seems a little bit about what the book is about. You know, we're going to persevere. Well, that, that's what I love about urban, urban ecology. Um, and, and that's that we as human beings try to rule what grows where. And all these plants that pop up in the sidewalk cramps are defying what we have tried to do because we pass laws, we laws that, that prohibit plants from growing where we don't want them, but they'll grow anywhere. And, and that, that pleases me to see this life defying what we are trying to suppress. Again, before we start, you talk, we, we, you jokingly said, I said, 
do you go out and look at these things every day? And you said, yeah, if you have nothing else to do. <laughs> but, um, but what are, you know, you even have a, a picture, I think, of the Eastern State Penitentiary and the ferns <sighs> that go there. And then I look, you know, and the picture, like I, I was going to, I should have said in the beginning, the pictures, are, the photographs are great. And they really are illustrative, especially for someone who's a novice. Um, and then what I started doing after I read the book was looking around. And I think that's a big deal of what the book's about, you know, start, take a look around. Well, I hope it does that. In fact, that was my motive for writing the book. Um, you know, most of the world's population now lives in cities. And what cities do is they disconnect us from nature. And uh, if we're disconnected from nature and lose our affinity for it, um, will we vote for politicians that protect nature? Will we, will we be an advocate for the planet? So I'm very pleased that you had a sense that this, of, oh, yeah. that this book helped you connect with with the natural world around you yeah it's like my bookstore there's a there's a health i mean a, a gym across the street from it and people will come in and they'll say yeah, i've been there 12 years and they'll say oh i never knew you were here and i said well how do you find out and they said well we go to the health club i'm thinking do you ever look up like last night there was a conjunction of jupiter saturn venus oh. and mars but people in the city don't look up Plus, if they did look up because of your light pollution, <laughs> That's they right. wouldn't see anything. That's correct. So, you know, well, go ahead. The, 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 uh, uh, people's attentions are shifting to virtual reality. And, and uh, any, any, any literature that can shift the attention to the actual world around them is something I think is, is helpful. Yeah, I just interviewed a guy named David Chalmers who wrote a book called Reality Plus. And we got into an argument because he was stating that virtual reality is essentially equivalent with reality. And I was trying to explain to him the reason why it isn't. But, you know, we try to listen to other people's positions. And I did. And there was some merit in some of it. But I just can't see it that way. And like I said, when you go out every day, what you're saying, you could reproduce if you had those on and you would lose your uh so you would suspend your disbelief but uh, you know over over the court you, you've been doing this for close to 40 years right that's correct well it's really since childhood oh that's uh, what i was going to ask what got you started uh when i was a kid i i was always interested in the local critters but collecting butterflies really got me started um, and I went to a natural science camp uh, in Virginia, uh, which uh, valued uh, documentation. We kept little notebooks. We had to take tests. Um, um, and we were exposed to um, knowledgeable people about natural history. And so ever since then, I've been uh, interested in natural history. It's interesting. It's like Vladimir Nabokov, who yeah. is a writer, but then that's spent right. A good portion of his life chasing butterflies and has them named after him. But he chose to do the other, and you chose to become a physician. I'm wondering why you didn't choose to go into the area that you write this book about. Um, you know, that's a that's a great question. I I think I like people as well, and I in deciding whether you know, what, what I wanted to do with my life, I think I needed to have more contact with people. My, my work in natural history is very much a, uh, a solitary kind of uh, activity. And I think I needed more human contact. So that's why I went into, in, into medicine. And also, I think Einstein wrote, said, don't eat what you love. And, and I didn't want to make my living um, doing natural history. I thought um, I, could, I could do that as something, as a pleasure on the side. 
Yeah, I think I do understand that. But going back to your wanders around the city, and I mentioned the Eastern State Penitentiary. Did you just happen to walk by or in the morning you got up and said, hey, I'm going to go over there today and see what's growing out of the wall? Or do you just pass by and go, wow, and then you spend an hour looking at it? That's it. That's it. I, I would pass by and I'd say, oh, look at those ferns growing on that wall. I've never seen them growing like that anywhere else. And that captures my attention. And then I look into it. And then I find out that that fern doesn't mate. And it doesn't require water the way most ferns do. Um, most ferns, fer, uh, sperm has to swim from the male to the female. Uh, and that means there has to be water. But on the wall of the Eastern State Penitentiary, these ferns can grow and propagate without water because they don't need swarm don't uh, sperm don't need to swim from one sex to the other so i thought well that is interesting um are you married do you have kids yeah I, i'm married no no children uh well, what if you're, you and your wife are going out to dinner do you, do you just stop and does she like tolerate you or does you know we're late <laughs> you know something like that well um we each have our own our own interests. Uh, she's interested in Arabic percussion, <laughs> and, and so each each of us has something to offer the other. <laughs> That's about as far apart as you can get. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can't go through the whole book, but you know the sections from herbaceous annuals to perennials, trees. Let's talk a little bit about lump the plants in one section because we don't have enough time and then let's lump the animals in another section and for whatever reason i kind of am interested in things like mice and cockroaches and rats who kind of live with us who are domesticated with us and but how do you go about finding their lairs and habitats in your own home well um, everything in the book, everything I write about are things that I have actually seen. And so we have had mice in our home and we've had cockroaches, uh, spiders. Um, uh, so yes, uh, they are, uh, they are things that I have, I have personally witnessed. Um, well, when you talk about light pollution, I mean, all my life, I've noticed that I, if I turn on the light outside, part of me feels bad because yes, I need the light, but I'm really pissing off and really ruining the lives of other creatures. And I'm sure that's something, even when um, people build a new housing development and you have the meeting, there's astronomers who come to the meeting and say, well, you can't build this because they have their own bailiwick. You can't build these houses because I won't be able to look at the stars. So do, do you keep that in mind, at least in your own life? Oh, um, I do to some extent. I mean, we do not own a car, um, so we're not contributing to pollution that way. And you know, at the same time, pollution, you know, our whole, we've, we've so radically changed the environment that many organisms have adapted to what we do. And uh, for example, spiders benefit from light pollution because they collect around the light and they, they reproduce, lay their eggs right around our porch light. Um, the our lightning bugs may light fireflies may also benefit from light pollution because they have a predator, another firefly that lights it dark. And in our neighborhood, those predators are absent. So what we call pollution uh, may be from 
from a from one point of view. Yeah. So someone's got to look at it in spite of, in spite of, we are able to adapt. We are able to actually select for the front doorbell, the front door light. That's right. That's interesting. I would never have thought of that. Well, if we talk about, well, let's jump into one of the parts of the first section, just picking it out on the difference between herbaceous annuals and perennials. I'm just trying to drill down because you do divide these up into discrete sections. So what would be the primary difference in sexual reproduction between the annuals and the perennials? Because I don't particularly like planting annuals because I have to replant them every year. And I like perennials. Yeah, I would say that the primary, the primary difference is that um, many perennials can reproduce vegetatively. So they send out uh, roots that track along underground and then pop up three feet away. Whereas annuals tend not to do that. Uh, so there are like mugwort may grow completely vegetatively and for almost like a clone. Uh, but there's no chance that a annual would would be able to do that or reproduce like that way. Well, like I said, with regard to my annual gardening budget, um, I can't plan an annual and expect it to come back next year. So where does it go in terms of its own propagation? How does it decide? Basically, why, why does it continue if it's an annual? Just that's by its very name. Well, by, by an annual, it usually, usually that means in our, in our neck of the woods, it means it can't overwinter. It dies in, 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 in the winter, it lives for one, one season. Um, and annuals, they're great in sidewalk cracks because the crack prevents them from putting down deep roots that can protect them from frost. Um, uh, so the annual can grow superficially in a sidewalk crack, send, a, send up its flowers, make seed. The seed can then wash over the sidewalk, uh, lodge in the crack where it spends the winter. And then the next, the next season, it germinates and uh, goes through its life cycle. A perennial would have more trouble doing that. It's interesting because one of the first times I thought paradoxically, about the book was when I realized there are some advantages as you just enumerated them for living in a crack. Yeah, especially in the city where it may be one of the only, well, it's the dominant habitat in, in places covered with asphalt and concrete or, or pavement cracks. Yeah. When I had a house that had stone walls, I was amazed at the things that would come out of the, and also the fact that it would, there, then some of the mortar would come out because there was, there was so much power behind their growth that, you know? Yes, that's, that's why plants that grow in cracks are not always loved. <laughs> right, right, I, ivy being the worst, ivy being so destructive, especially on your house. That's right. That's right. Of course, it's a perennial, but um, yeah, it it uh, it can degrade a facade very quickly. Yeah, I'm personal experience. When you talk about moths, for example, say like, and I don't know if I'm correct about this, but a luna moth, the really big ones, right? Where are they hiding? And how did they come out? Because I, when someone sees them, they go, how beautiful this is. And they immediately get their phone and take a picture of it. But where have they been and how have they gotten here? And why do you find them out on your front door? Right. Well, the, the Luna moth, uh, uh, overwinters as a cocoon. And then it hatches in the summer or late spring. 
uh, from its cocoon. And then the female emits a pheromone that wafts through the air, overcoming buildings and uh, barriers, attracts males, they mate, then the female will disperse, lay eggs on a food plant, host plant, and those caterpillars will feed for the rest of the season, pupate, make a cocoon, and then this cycle goes on. Well, if it's, if it's the pheromone and the odor of it, that was another paradox I found in the book, perhaps not a paradox, but a, a problem for my understanding is that because of all the pollution, whether it's carbon related pollution or restaurants or anything, I mean, I, I understand that all these creatures have a much better developed olfactory sense than we do. But isn't it all like a big tangle to them? Don't they get confused? How do they still separate the one scent from all these other smells? Well, that that is really an interesting question. And I don't think we really know. Huh. Um, uh, what we do know is that many insects are able to find each other in the city. But to what extent? Um, air pollution may interfere with their olfactory uh, processes um, has not been really well uh, studied in the, I have a chapter on the Cecropia moth and uh, that was done in, in, a, in a city and the moths were able to find the females okay. But even so, we don't know to what extent they may have been thrown off by um, pollutants in the, in the atmosphere. And the same is true for bees, uh, the extent to which uh, pollutants may interfere with bees. We know that bees pollinate flowers in the city. We can see that. But what we don't know is to what extent pollutants may interfere with that process. Maybe there'd be more and better pollination uh, if the olfactory sense of, of, of uh, bees were not interfered with by air pollution. Well, I think everybody from newspapers and just general parlance, people recognize that there's a problem with honeybees throughout the country and them going away, perhaps. Is this, is, oh, and you talk about it in the book, but what about honeybees in the city? Are they there? What are they, where do they, where are their hives? And yeah, um, there's a, at least in, in Philadelphia, there's a well-developed community of beekeepers and um, their hives are on the roofs of buildings and people's backyards. Uh, in Philadelphia, honeybees are basically domesticated animals. Um, and whether there are any wild hives in our area, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but that's distinct from bumblebees, which are, um, to, they're, they're, they're used in greenhouses for pollination of tomatoes. But basically, most bumblebees and uh, other bees are, are wild. That's interesting. That's another situation in which there is a symbiotic relationship in the city. Because as you said, otherwise they would have a, a lot of trouble if they could do it at all. And it's us who have allowed their existence to thrive. That's very true of, of, of honeybees, yeah. Well, so um, again, turning to animals, and um, let me just scroll down because I kind of did this with the, oh yeah, you don't spend a lot of time with, um, mice and rats and cockroaches. I mean, they're in there, but they're not, the mice, the mice to me are really, and you know, talk about domestication. Are there any mice in the city that are essentially not domesticated? There are white-footed mice, which is another species of mice and they're in the city. Um, they seem to thrive quite well. And house mice, uh, the house mouse can live outside 
we see them in our backyard um, and they may clean up around bird feeders uh, the, the bird seed that falls to the ground, they may uh, support house mice. So with regard to something like pigeons, for example, are we still talking about a situation where they wouldn't hang out with us unless we kind of took care of them? That's, that's a, a, a good question. I, I suspect pigeons may be dependent uh, to a large extent on people feeding them. Um, whether they would, of course, they, there are species that evolved before there were human beings, uh, but pigeons have been domesticated since the uh, Egyptians. So our pigeons are called feral pigeons um, because they're considered descendants of, of domesticated animals. Whether they would survive on their own at this point is a good question. There are some things I see that I don't understand at all. For example, at one of our supermarkets, there's seagulls, there's gulls, and I don't know why they're there and I don't know what they're doing there. Am I right? Are they? I mean, I don't know enough to know whether they're actually gulls or what kind of gulls they are, but they're there, you know, pretty much nine months a year. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I guess it's a, it may be a, an example of evolution or adaptation that they've learned that living with us is more productive than living apart. It's funny when you were talking about um, with the olfactory sense, and I was thinking, uh, with regard to the lights and things like that. It's again, like a human behavior. I mean, guys who want to get girls, they know which bar to go to in order to ask the question might, that might lead to courtship and then some. So is there like <laughs> a situation where these guys know where to hang out? Like this has become the proper hangout in order to accomplish their purpose. If there's like a corner drug, there's a corner drugstore or the street like they like to hang out under. Yeah, well, uh, that's in, in, you know, cities, cities are hard places to find mates if you're a plant or if you're an animal. And, and um, the European paper wasp has what are called lex, L-E-K-S. And these are meeting places. Ma males find a prominent uh, gathering place, like on a telephone pole, and they'll gather there and when there are enough of them, females notice and they are attracted to them. Um, and the, this lek forming behavior is used by mosquitoes. You'll see a, a swarm of mosquitoes. Well, that, that swarm are almost all males and females will fly into the swarm and, and, and be mated. Uh, in the case of the um, longhorn beetle, the, that yellow striped beetle that I figured that eats locusts, its larvae eat locust trees, they, they mate on, on, on goldenrod, apparently exclusively on goldenrod. So the two, the two sexes find each other on, on the goldenrod. So, you know, plants and animals don't have mating, uh, uh, how do you call it, dating apps the way, the way people do. And so they have to have their own systems for finding each other. And it's remarkable how diverse these systems are and how effectively they work in an urban environment. When you bring in, as you have in this conversation, European or Astralasian characters, do you travel much to do, to, or are you relying on research or do you actually travel um, to do this? Um, I do very little traveling, uh, so this would be research. Okay. Um, uh, people, people, friends say, "Oh, you really ought to go to Costa Rica. That you know, the the nature there is fantastic." And I say, "Well, I've got my hands full just trying to understand what's what's growing in the sidewalk cracks." So it's very zen. It's extremely zen. Um, 
well, since you don't go to them, what about the creatures that come to us from back even in revolutionary times when a ship would come in and would have all kinds of things from where it came from, including the plague? But what about like uh, the Japanese lanternfly that we have tons of out here and destroy trees? What about the creatures that you've discovered, if you have, that aren't native to our country that have come over and have found a really, wow, this is really great. I love it here. Yeah, well, I guess the plants that colonize cities are commonly um, introduced. And they were introduced because we wanted them, we thought they were pretty, or they were introduced by accident, mostly introduced on purpose. Really? Um, but in case of the um, spotted lanternfly, that was an accidental introduction. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how, how well it endures over the next few years. It's pretty resilient, as are stink bugs. Stink bugs are really tough to get rid of. Yeah, and we have native and introduced stink bugs. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, yeah. There are stink bugs uh, are a whole family of, of insects. Um, so we have a stink bug that was introduced about two decades ago into Pennsylvania, and this is spread around the country. Um, marmorated stink yeah. bug, yeah. brown marmorated stink bug, yeah. Yes, and what a defense mechanism they have because it's very difficult to catch them. And you have, you know, and I've learned, I've evolved that you do not want to crush them and you want to be very careful wrapping them in tissue and lightly placing them in the toilet. Otherwise, you you could risk a very unpleasant evening. That's interesting. I, uh... Yeah, I've learned from them. Isn't that, that is interesting. <laughs> we have this little vacuum cleaner, this little insect vacuum cleaner that sucks them up and then you just dump them down the toilet. Well, well. You, you, mu you must have a good habitat for the brown marmorated stink bug. Yes, we've just moved and I'm really happy because they don't seem to have moved with us. And uh, yeah, the other thing is that if you take, for example, uh, this is something that you feel aesthetically. If you take the Japanese lanternfly, it's one of the most beautiful creatures I've ever seen. It's lovely, but then again, it does such damage. You know, it's like, and I assume it's lovely because again, going back to the premise of the book, I assume part of its loveliness is designed to attract. Well, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, it could be warning coloration to predators to not to eat it. Um, poisonous insects are often brightly colored to deter predators from messing with them. But it could also be sexual. Um, the attraction uh, may induce the induce mating. We don't know. What about with lightning bugs? I bet you one of your first loves was lightning bugs when you were a kid. Oh yeah, I love them. What kid doesn't? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, it was. You know, you can remember. So it's so evocative remember going out at twilight or dusk and just hunting them, putting them in a glass jar, which wasn't the nicest thing to do. But yeah, it's, yeah, I guess some of this is evocative for you too. I mean, it brings back memories of your early childhood, I would think from time to time. Yeah, well, it's a continuation. I've often wondered could, what happens to people as they mature how they lose that love because kids seem to instinctively be drawn to bugs and insects and small animals but as as we mature and develop we many of us seem to lose that and and why that happens is something that interests me well i think both of us to a certain degree are still children I mean, if we both have the sense of why, you know, it is a sense of wonder. And like I said, the people don't know my bookstore is there because they don't look at it. If you look at something, I think William Saroyan said that 
beauty is anything looked at with particularity. And I've always thought of that. And, uh, but in order to do that, you have to pay attention. Particularity requires attention. Yes, I, I've noticed there are certain types of stores that I don't see. Um, and they're stores that I'm not interested in. Usually they involve uh, personal hygiene stores. I just don't notice them. <laughs> well, it's like I just went to the Antiquarian Book Fair yesterday in New York. And there's a certain type, oh, that's a, it's a perfect example. There's a certain type of book I'm interested in. But if I see a stand that has Italian Renaissance books, which are lovely and expensive, I don't see it. I see it, but I don't. I just walk straight by it and go to the modern English first editions or something like that. That's a very good point. But you seem to be very parochial in the sense that, no, opposite of parochial. Um, you seem to welcome everything as far as the animal life and the insect life that you've discovered in your city. Hey, do you ever find anything new? I guess you do. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Is that like Christmas morning for you? <laughs> just, just yesterday, I was photographing the male and female flowers of white mulberry, uh, which I wrote about, but I'd never really gotten a good photo of the flowers and it was so exciting to see this mulberry flower uh, this female mulberry flower and it looked like a it was shaped like a mulberry fruit only out of each little round part of the fruit there was a stigma pulling in pollen so um, the mul each each mulberry fruit has to be pollinated many times in order to produce a mulberry fruit. I, I was in awe looking at those. <laughs> That's great. What a wonderful feeling. Hey, what kind of camera do you use? Um, my, the camera I use is a called a Nikon 800, which was produced maybe 10 years ago with a macro lens. So it's an S it's an SLR. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cause the pictures are, the photos are really well, I mean, they're great and it really does help amplify the book. And uh, yeah, especially as you were saying, the pistol and the stamen when you can actually see them or that one picture where you can see the sperm of one, what, what's that one leaf where you have the two pictures? Oh, there's a, um, there's a liverwort. Um, is that what you're referring to with the male and the female yes. sex organs on the, yes. on the liverwort yeah. body? Yeah. yeah. yeah that, <laughs> that was a great, that must've been a hard find. I mean, unless that happens, I mean, unless you're able to see that all the time, but it seemed to me that, wow, this is pretty cool that he found this. Yeah. The, the fortunate thing is to be with your camera at the right time of year when, when they're expressing those sexual features and that might be just one week out of the year that you can that you can see that yeah yeah i guess the weather if, do, you, do you go out in the rain in order to do this sometimes um i my my i'm afraid for my camera getting oh yeah but, right but when photographing mosses often i'll bring an atomizer and spritz them because they'll open up and and reveal their um, uh, sexual organs only when they're wet, and so I'll because they they mate by producing sperm, and the sperm has to have water and to to swim in. Well, I think to, in conclusion, I think if I go downtown and find a guy with a camera and a spritzer, well. <laughs> <laughs> I will come up and say hello because I'll know it's you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so anyway, our guest today has been Kenneth D. Frank. The book is Sex and City Plants, Animals, Fungi, and More, A Guide to Reproductive Diversity. It'll be in our store because it was released just a couple of weeks ago, and it was published by Columbia University Press. Thanks so much, Kenneth. It's been a pleasure Thanks, talking Sam. to you. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.